Hello, my name is Michelle Maidment. I'm a content solutions developer at NCFE. Previously, I was a teacher in special education for 20 years, becoming a deputy head teacher in the latter part of that, as well as a SENCO in a mainstream school and also a local authority advisor for supporting children with additional needs. And I just wanted to um, have a chat today about successful partnership working. Uh, the aims and objectives of the presentation, we're going to look at the benefits of partnership working, think about who is involved in that, and then also look at barriers and how we can overcome them. So obviously good relationships with families benefit everyone and it really is best if we're all working together with the child or young person at the centre of our actions and support and in fact involving parents and carers in their children's learning can be one of the most important factors in enabling children to do well um, whatever their background and those strong relationships very very important and can raise aspirations so as a family becomes more aware of how a child is doing at school they can support the learning of the young person so it's it's really important that they can get involved and know what's going on because children generally aren't the most communicative when they get home about what they've been doing at school for professionals they know that they're going to have support from home so they are in turn more able to support the child or young person with any challenges in their personal life and can really coordinate that holistic approach and work towards common goals for the child and their family. And for the child or young person, this can be so crucial. Um, if they have any issues with attendance or mental health, which since the pandemic we've seen a really big rise in, then this can be supported through communication with home. Um, they'll feel more motivated if their family believes in the value of education, then they will start to believe in it as well and will want to do well and achieve. And then also feeling valued improves self-esteem and the child or young person should become more engaged and aware and just knowing that people are valuing them thinking about them caring about them and talking about them can really help them in making them um, want to achieve more so if we're talking about send partnership working um, not all of this is about send but obviously that's a big part of it because children and young people with additional needs certainly can have more people involved um, in their education and other parts of their lives. So Section 19 of Children and Families Act and also the same Code of Practice 2015, they set out general principles um, that local authorities must have regard to when they're thinking about supporting children and young people with additional needs with SEND. So um, they expect us to work together as equal partners with parents and carers and any other external agencies as well um, and with the child and young person at the centre and that's called co-production and it really is important to take into account everyone's views to ensure that holistic approach leading to the best possible outcomes um, they state that particular attention must be paid to the views wishes and feelings of children and their parents and also young people now, it can sometimes be challenging to do this, especially when the young person has reached the age of 16. The SEND Code of Practice makes it clear that once a child becomes a young person at the age of 16, local authorities and others should normally engage directly with the young person rather than their parents. However, the same code also makes it clear that the young person's family and parents should continue to be involved in discussions about their future the young person can also ask them to help in other ways, such as attending meetings with them, filling in forms, receiving correspondence on their behalf. But you can see that there can be a real difficulty with sort of trying to um, 
work between the parent carer and the young person and it's particularly important for 16 and 17 year olds because their parents will still retain parental responsibility until they reach the age of 18. And we have to be aware of the Mental Capacity Act because that does state a person is not to be treated as unable to make a decision merely because they make an unwise decision. And I'm sure as adults, we'll all agree that we may have weighed unwise decisions at times. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't make decisions for ourselves. So it's very important that everyone is participating as fully as possible and that all the information is provided to enable them to make informed decisions. This is just, um, you've got to consider how many external agencies might be involved with a family of a child or young person with SEND. And it's just, you know, spin that wheel and see what comes up. And you've got to think of who that family might have interacted with that day, that week, that month. It really could be a whole myriad of people that they've had to engage with and tell a story over and over. You can understand why they may start to feel frustrated, particularly if conflict and advice is given. So we really do try to need to show some understanding about why they might get frustrated at times and may need to vent. It really does add an extra layer of complexity when you're trying to do partnership work and around children and young people with SEND, but it is vitally important that we work together to achieve that holistic support. So some of the barriers to good partnership work, and if we start with families first, if a family have had a positive or negative experience at school, then that will affect their opinion on how they're going to work with someone in an education provision. When they've interacted with other services, have they had a fight to access those services or have the services been inflexible to the family or young person's needs? And quite often, families are only getting a crisis management approach. They're not having something put in to support them at a proactive level. Sometimes there's an effective support for people with challenging behaviour and also the families can be labelled as obstructive if they're questioning professional opinion, but actually they do know that child or young person the best and we do have to be prepared to take account of that. Cultural beliefs, so how is education or SEND viewed in their community? How is education, how is the, the way we interact with education viewed? So it could be a heritage. So for instance, if you come from a Asian or Caribbean community, but also it can be localized culture linked to economic circumstances. So in areas where you might have third generation unemployment and complete lack of employment opportunities, families are sometimes going to say, well, what is the point of education? And it's really down to us to try and work together and show how we can tease out those opportunities for that child or young person. Could also have language difficulties. So if a family has English as a second language, or it may be that if um, the parents or carers of the young child or person also have SEND, then they might find it very difficult to understand formal language, letters, can't access social media very well. So we've really got to try and think of different ways how we can share information and work together. And then time or resources, because the family, they could have um, jobs, they might be quite inflexible with giving them time off and they may not be able to afford to travel to a meeting if they can't drive or whatever. So we've got to think about how we can be a little bit more flexible and adapt to meet their needs. For professionals, there are also barriers. So we know that a lot of provision has limited resources and if workload is massive, then a lot of professionals aren't going to look to take on more workload by trying to arrange meetings and working outside of their, their normal hours. Time constraints can be a big problem, particularly in schools and educational provision, because actually I know we've um, in the past in the school I worked in, um, children's services advised the parent or carer to go back to school and work with um, the teachers. Unfortunately, um, the crisis happened on Christmas Day 
and we weren't available until the beginning of January. So those time constraints can be a, a massive barrier to partnership working or if um, external agencies are wanting to arrange a meeting during the summer holidays. So all those things can become a barrier. There can be mistrust from families. So I've mentioned children's services and a lot of families can be so wary that if they think that they are going to get involved and they're going to be under the microscope, then that can be a real barrier to them wanting to come and work in partnership. And then there's also lack of access to training for professionals. So sometimes professionals might not actually understand quite what a family needs. And without that, they're not going to be able to sign post and they're not going to be able to work in partnership to offer that support. So how can we overcome these? So honest and open communication is really important. People have to trust each other. And if we can't have that transparency, then we're not going to have successful partnership working. We also need to accept that everyone has their own challenges and a teacher's challenge will be no more important than a parent or carer's challenge than a educational psychologist challenges. And we have to accept and acknowledge that everyone is facing their own different challenges and try and understand why someone might have trouble trying to access a meeting or whatever. We need to acknowledge that we all have expertise. And like I've just said, a parent or carer really does have a, a lot of knowledge and expertise to share about their child or young person. So we do need to take that into account. But we've also got to think that a teacher is going to be able to offer the most on education, um, whereas children's services will be able to offer more about how they can support outside of school. And we have to think about how we can all bring that together. We need to make sure information is accessible. So try not to use too much jargon. And if we do, then we need to explain what it is um, at the beginning so that parents and carers in particular aren't feeling like they have to stop a meeting and go, I'm sorry, what does that mean? Because that can be quite intimidating amongst a, a large group of professionals. So we really have to try and, and keep it jargon free and for each other to understand as well. Think about the family's other commitments when arranging meetings. You may need to adjust the time, the date and the venue accordingly to make sure that they're given the best chance of accessing. We have to respect the differences between individual families. And again, this can come back to culture. So we've got to think and try and be sensitive around how we would handle all of the different issues and challenges that might come up. If possible, it's really beneficial to include family carers in training. So whether that's a parent, an aunt, a grandparent, if they're having a lot of input into that child's life, then it's really useful for them to understand a little bit about any additional needs. And by involving them in some training, that can be so useful to everyone and really let them see how um, they're their child or young person has been affected and what we can do to support. And last but by no means least, we have to keep communication channels open. And sometimes if you disagree and if you've had a particularly difficult meeting, it can be really challenging to do that because you might just feel like you need a break from it and you don't want to engage with that person for a little while. But if you close those channels, it is really important to get the trust back and for um, parents and carers to think that you're going to respond to them and listen to them. So do try and keep those open. OK, thank you for listening. I do hope that you found that useful and picked up some tips for partnership working. Please feel free to leave some feedback by scanning the QR code and completing the form.